exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> we can do that. That's true. <laughs> Scusate, buonasera, benvenuti, abbiamo più del quarto d'ora accademico oggi di ritardo, ci scusiamo, però abbiamo una bellissima occasione, abbiamo aspettato l'arrivo di Oqui Envedzor, D. Reeves, Spike Lee e Fiasta Gates. Io sono Astrid Welter della Fondazione Prada e sono felicissima di avervi presentato i nostri ospiti stasera, ma sono anche molto felice che siete venuti così numerosi per ascoltare la loro conversazione. Okui Envedzor, curatore storico dell'arte nigeriano, direttore del Museo Haus der Kunst fino a poco tempo fa, è stato il direttore della Biennale di Venezia nel 2015, del Guangzhou Biennale in Cina, della Documenta, eccetera, una lunga, lunga carriera appunto nel campo dell'arte contemporanea e uh, tuttora editore della rivista NCA, Journal of Contemporary African Art. Okui Envezor eh, sarà il moderatore di questa conversazione che ha appunto qua presente due registi, D. Reeves e Spike Lee e Theastra Gates. Come molti di voi sapranno, il motivo di questo talk è la mostra di Theaster Gates all'osservatorio che abbiamo inaugurato due giorni fa, The Black Image Corporation, che parla della, delle vicende della casa editrice Johnson Publishing a Chicago, che è, è stata un'impresa identitaria per la definizione dell'immagine afroamericana. Spike Lee e D. Reed sono due importanti esponenti del cinema in America e la conversazione riguarderà appunto questi temi tra l'arte e il cinema che riguardano le, le, la costituzione identitaria nell'immagine in America oggi. So I just introduced you very briefly and I give my the word to Okwi Envidzor who is going to present his guests and uh, I hope you will all enjoy the talk. Um, thank you so much, Astrid. Um, it's a singular pleasure and honor of mine uh, to sit on stage with three remarkable people. You know, remarkable not only in terms of the work they've produced over the last 30, 35 years, but also remarkable for the presence of their work in the world and the effects of their work on the public imagination, but most importantly, the effects of their work in terms of how we think the black image and its relationship to representation. Uh, I shall like to begin with a very brief introduction of the three principals sitting on stage with me here, uh, Tiasta Gates, D. Rees, and Spike Lee. Um, and I will try not to read the account of their numerous accomplishments because I already have introduced them by saying that 
in terms of the, how remarkable their work and the presence of their work um, have been in the world. So, Tiasa Gates, as Elstreet uh, just mentioned, um, just opened an exhibition of both incredible power and subtlety a few days ago um, here in Milan. And the, the, the first thing that you think about when you go into this exhibition is to question whether this is Fiesta's work or is this work Fiesta as a curator. I think that both things operate in tandem, you know, the artist and the curator. The thinker of forms, if you will, and the thinker of images. And, and I should like to say that if there is a way to think about this particular exhibition, one will begin by noting the fact that what is on display is Tiasta's archival imagination. But Tiasta's work spans many different genres from sculpture to film, to music, to painting, but also the work he's done with his incredible and inimitable group, the Black Monks of Mississippi. The kind of sonic resonance of that work, the power of the voice, the singularity with which the voice seeks to alter the unalterable and to make music out of it. And, but yes, that has also been not just simply an artist who focuses on his own practice, but an artist who focuses on his community, on different forms of city making, just like his focus on archive making, his focus on city making with his rebuilt foundation in Chicago. He has sought to help us think about the crisis of the urban context in American cities, most specifically the city of Chicago, riven in the middle between the south side and the other parts of the city, almost as if, if you will, a segregation line, uh, a neighborhood that has been depopulated, a neighborhood that has been scarred by the flight of capital, by the collapse of capitalism, if you will, and how he has sought through his rebuilt foundation to come to terms with that form of urban deracination. And the remarkable thing about the rebuilt foundation and I say this because that it also connects very much with the work of, of you know, Spike Lee. But the remarkable thing about Rebuild Foundation is the fact that this work is not yes, the acting as a philanthropist or as an activist. Again, this work exists in tandem with his artistic practice. So, he has, has won numerous, numerous awards and prizes, and I'm not going to list them, but except to say thank you so much, Tiasta, for giving me the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Uh, D. Rees, um, whom I met for the very first time last night, um, I, I don't think if she remembered seeing me through the fog of jet lag, but <laughs> uh, nevertheless, whose work and practice I've you know, come to admire very deeply for his fearlessness, 
for its exploration of questions that have become not only very important but urgent in our contemporary culture, questions around the representation of women, around the representation of gender, around the representation uh, of race, but also around the representation of sexuality. What does it mean you know, to bring black lesbian subjectivity to the screen and how to make that representation normative, not other. And her work as a filmmaker, again, spans different genres, uh, from documentary to the short, and of course, um, her very highly, you know, praised films, um, um, feature films, sorry, um, such as Eventual Salvation, Paria, Bessie, and Mudbound. Um, I think that Mudbound is the uh, latest in her attempt to really tell a very complex series of the American um, community, as it were. And, and, and I shouldn't, you know, I should also say, but one of the important things is that Reese was a student of Spike Lee at New York University. And uh, so it's really uh, fantastic to have both of them here on stage. And um, so please help me welcome Dee Reese. Well, you know, Spike Lee needs no introduction, but, you know, let's first begin by saying he's an icon and one of the most important filmmakers of the last half century. And I don't want to recite um, all the accomplishments um, of, of, of Spike. You know, you know, where shall, how shall we begin? Uh, shall we begin with, um, if we were to draw a map, if we were to draw a cartography of Spike's career, it would involve so many things. Spike Lee, um, even though as a young filmmaker becoming a mentor to actors, uh, Halle Berry, you know, they got their first break, you know, being directed by Spike Lee. Spike, you know, Halle Berry, Wesley Snipes, Lawrence Fishburne, and on and on. Spike Lee and popular culture. I mean, who could forget all those commercials with Michael Jordan and the videos with Michael Jackson and so on. Spike Lee and feminism and misogyny. She's got a... <laughs> Have it, his very first film. So if you go through, you know, Spike's uh, career up until the, the, the latest film that I believe will be re released in Italy in a few weeks, uh, Black Klansman, he's been sort of pushing us to ask questions of what film is capable of doing, what sort of stories that film can tell. But you know, to unpack all those questions, we will have to stay here the entire evening. So help me welcome Spike Lee on stage. So now I'm just gonna up, open it with a question for the three of you. And, and I'm going to stay again in my corner while I let you. <laughs> You know, um, you know, tussle with, with the question. I, I think it, my question is really deeply inspired by Tiesta's work and inspired by the current exhibition, which if many of you have not seen it, 
It's called the Black Image Corporation, uh, Cooperation and derives from this massive archive. Um, you know, there's no way to describe this archive of Johnson Publishing in Chicago except to call it a monument of black culture in the 20th century. Um, there is nothing like it, and Kiasa has been working in excavating this archive of images, and so, being that all three of you work with images, I want to begin with you, Spike, to talk about the idea of the politics of, Im of the image. Does that really guide the way you, you, you see your work as a filmmaker? Well, I would first like to thank Mrs. Prada for doing this. for putting up my man here, putting the show up, inviting D, myself, to the show last night. Got a beautiful audience here, so grazie. <laughs> I, image is very, very important. I'm gonna try to talk slow so the translator can keep up. The United States of America, the foundation of the United States of America was built upon genocide of the native people and slavery. George Washington owned slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Several other presidents of the United States of America owned slaves. In the Constitution of the United States, so the Constitution of the United States of America says that slaves are listed as three-fifths of a human being, not three-thirds, not four-fourths, not five-fifths, less than whole. So you have to start there. If we don't, you got to start at the beginning. Our ancestors were stolen from Mother Africa and brought to various places. We built this country on the land that was stolen from Native Americans. Like, Jim, like my Brooklyn brother Jay-Z says, fact. That's a fact. So therefore, if we're seen by this country as less than human being, that's going to be reflected in how we are seen. Even today, I was furious when I saw that cartoon by that Australian motherfucker of, of Serena when she lost the U.S. Open. And then my sister, who's Blasian, whose father is Haitian, whose mother Japanese, he drew her as a blonde woman. This is what we're dealing with, imagery. When I was growing up in Brooklyn, at a very young age, my mother would color in the children's books birthday cards. When I got birthday cards, she, they didn't make birthday cards for black folks. She colored it in. I remember my mother telling me Elizabeth Taylor was not Cleopatra. And I was five years old. So I came from a household where we were even before James Brown's song, his anthem, Say a Lot on Black and I'm Proud, we, we, me and my siblings and I were getting that in the house. So if I have, if that was my base, it was just natural that would come up, come out of me when I became, when I decided to become a filmmaker. But all that stuff happened very early on that we come from a beautiful, noble people 
And that's the way it is. So that was my mindset from the jump. I would just jump in and say that, you know, I, I can't think about the politics of the image without thinking about the politics of the creation of the image in the first place. And so, you know, we talked earlier in the back room, like we were chatting about how radical it is or how arresting it is to walk in the Met or to walk in a museum and see a photograph or a painting of a black subject. And I think the reason that is, is because there's a certain, for me as a viewer, it makes me question the, the intention in a way that I don't question intention on other subjects, and it makes me want to know, is there a deliberation there? Like, what does it mean? And I think because there's such a dearth and because there's not the foundation which can be built upon, black image is standing in for so much because there's an absence. And so it can't just be this character. It can't just be woman holding oranges. It suddenly becomes loaded, and so I'm wanting to know, like, what was the painter thinking? Why is she holding an orange? Like, who, you know, and what, what, what would be different if she were holding a different object? And so for me, you know, as a filmmaker, the politics of creation and who's holding the camera, I'm, I'm always wondering who's on the other side of the lens, who's on the other side of the brush, in a way with black subjects that I may not be with, with, with mainstream art, and it's because it has to be so much. And for me, the battle is not being so representational all the time. Like, how can a character, how can Elike just be Elike? How can Florence just be Florence? Like, why do they have to stand in and, and like explain themselves and explain so much? And you know, for audiences to be able to to empathize with them or connect with them. Can I, if I could jump on that real quick? Please go ahead. Very important point you made because I'm going to use a huge example as as, a, as an example. Nola Darlin was one character. And I think there was only one other film that year that had an African American woman was the lead. It was a Whoopi Goldberg film. And so when you only have one person has to represent the whole race, it's like a straitjacket. Because African Americans, we are not one monolithic group. We don't think alike, look alike. My brother right here, he's from Chicago by way of Mississippi. <laughs> and I'm from Brooklyn, New York, but my, my, from, my father's from Alabama, my mother's from Georgia because there was, there was this migration from the South to the city, but we're not all monolithic the group. And so when one character, I mean, we're talking about 1986 when she said it came out, so much different than it is now. When you have one person that has to represent the entire race, it's hard. Or even when you have 15 or 25, that, that what I've found is that there's a way in which we essentialize black images so that you get, you used to have an Aunt Jemima, and that was one way of understanding the, the black female, and now all you'll get is like. Wait, wait you can't leave an Uncle Ben. And without an Uncle Ben, and then you'd have one or two black images today that kind of stand in as the dominant figure. And so one of the things I wanted to do with the exhibition and with the films is kind of demonstrate a proliferation of black images so that it's not just the hooker or the crack whore. It, it's not just the wealthy bitch that, that, that doesn't take any, any mess. There's, a, there's teachers and lawyers and doctors and normal people and, 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 and stay-at-home moms and, and, and people who contribute to the life of this world and that that, and that that difference is like everybody else's difference, but we've never had the luxury of being imaged in proliferation. And so the Black Image Corporation is trying to demonstrate one after another, after another, after another, after another. And that, and that by looking at 20,000 images of black women, you start to recognize they're like, oh, can I ask you, can their I ask you lives are like my lives. Can, can you explain to audience Johnson Publications, Ebony Jet? I don't think they might not know. Hey, Spike, that's my question. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I'm going to shut up. <laughs> so, if, so then if we look at if we look at um, the title, Black Image Corporation, it's, it's a nod to the Johnson Publishing Company, which was a publication house in Chicago led by a couple, John Johnson and Eunice Johnson. 
not only were these folk great entrepreneurs, they, they knew business, they also understood that the image, that image making was hand in hand with identity formation, mm -hmm. which was hand in hand with nation building. Come on now. And that if we could get black people to not only see the negative portrayals that were happening in other magazines of that day, 1940, 1950, that in addition to those negative stereotypical images of black people, there are all these other moments that are not even just black aspirational, it's black truth. That there were veterinarians and dentists and uh, cotillions and there was Jack and Jill and there, there were things happening in the black community that were worth being proud of and no one was showing those images. Black middle class, right? A black middle class. And so in some ways, the Black Image Corporation is attempting to take this, this publishing company that didn't pivot toward the digital world, that, that is a kind of dinosaur of the printed image, and trying to say that there's still some kami, there's still, there's still spiritual life in those archives, there's still energy and force in them, but it requires somebody who knows how to activate the images, and that the, the, those, what are historical images are not just about history, they're about a kind of black power. And that's, so, so I think um, it's an archival project that's trying to wake up black power through you know, a reflection on, on old images. And, and I think that, that stratification you're talking about is really important. I was talking about it last night with another artist, Devin, and so we're talking about how like there's not strata, you know. It's like, you know, either the bus driver or the banker, and there's no in between. And then that's where it becomes problematic because then you get images made by people and you're, you're only going to see one layer. And then there's like a reaction to that, like we, well, we don't want to see that anymore at all. So now there can never be another like black bus driver, on, you know, and so I feel like the stratification like a, like loosens that scar tissue and allows us to embrace all of it and like because only one end or the other is presented I think there's like this kind of like um, chafe you know yeah. in terms of like being able to create you know? yeah. Yeah. let me ask you Tiesta you know if, if you see a line between activating these images bringing them back to life from the archive and the making of art is there a line between you know the making of art and the activation of those images. Yeah. So let's imagine we take all the titles away, curating, artist, activist, politician, entrepreneur. We take all of that away. If I were to try to pinpoint in a, a spiritual interest, it would be to demonstrate that people have the power to animate the material world in a way bigger than the material thing itself. So when I use an old fire hose to try to talk about the civil rights, that doesn't make me a fire hose artist. I'm not a fire hose artist. The fact that I'm using a fire hose is inconsequential. It happens that the activation of the fire hose helps us think about all these other things. It unlocks, it, it like, it unlocks something that's like real and powerful. That's no different from a set of archives with boxes that are from 1954 that haven't really been looked at since 1954. And to then see that box and just like want to do something with it. But the doing something with it requires permission from the owners, legal contracts, scanning, cleaning, organizing, sorting. And those are all things that administrators do and also artists have to do. But some artists might just take the image, photocopy it, put some chocolate on it, and call it art. Yeah. No, but, but I'm actually interested but, but, in something else. You ain't else. calling no names, are you? No, yeah, no, no, no. But, 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 but beyond those very pragmatic yes. um, things that you do to the image, do you, is there, do you intervene into the image? Where is your own politics vis-a-vis -vis those images? Yes. Because I, you know, I don't suppose they are neutral. 
Right. Well, first, one has to be able to identify that the Johnson Publishing Company's archive is, in, is important enough, worth spending time with and looking at. That hasn't been done enough. Spike uses those images. If you, if you need an image of uh, 1974, whatever, you call an image house and you say, hey, do you have any images of- Getty, mostly, right? Getty images. Uh, Getty. <laughs> but what if we were able to call Johnson Publishing, right? And so, so one part of it, I, I guess what I'm saying, is about the ability to unlock the spiritual potential or the, the uh, energy potential, the life, the life in things, right? The life inside of a paint tube. Paint is dead. A painter activates the life inside a tube. You know what I mean? Yeah. Archives are dead. Museums are dead. And it requires people that are willing to grapple with the material thing and the immaterial things in order to make those things powerful. So I think whether I'm engaged in the activation of an archive or engaged in the reactivation of a fire hose, both of those processes, even though they require different parts of my brain in order to make the activation happen, and they go to different platforms, they still feel like, oh, I'm interested in the spiritual life of things. I want to ask uh, Spike and Dee, because you know, um, I think it's safe to say that there is a proliferation, if you will, of black imagery today. Um, uh, should I call it a, a season of black imagery? Fashion magazines, maybe not September issue, maybe it's the October or March issue. <laughs> um, fashion magazines now have a, a slew of quote unquote black models in them or you know shall we say more diverse models and Spike you've just concluded uh, Black Klansman and you know D uh, with Modbound. Um, how do you see this idea of black imagery that Yes, he's speaking about playing out in your own work. What, what, are, what are the layers of meaning to be extracted in the way in which you work with this imagery? I think in, much in a way like Theastra, I'm, I'm interested in reclamation in a way. So for example, I'm interested in like the reclamation of black nudes, you know, in the, the, the reclamation of nudity for, for, for black people in a way that, you know, our, our bodies, you know, which were fetishized or exoticized, which happens in the fashion industry, how then do we present those images and show them fully and show them in detail without fetishizing them, without exoticizing them? And so that's something I'm always interested in exploring, like in my work and what's the line? And is the only difference who is making it, you know? And so for me, I feel like that reclamation's work and like being allowed to be in a space without, you know, people being worried about, oh, is this hot and taut Venus, you know, like our, our, our nude bodies were, you know, exploited. And so then how do we reclaim nudes, you know, in a non-exploitive way? Did you always think, you know, of, of that when, when, when you started making films? What were the most pressing questions you wanted to address in your films in terms of representation? Well, I didn't think about it in terms of like representation. I just wanted to show like a family, like yeah. this is this specific family. So I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in the South. My dad's a cop, my mom's a scientist, you know, and I came to New York. And for me, it was the first time seeing like out black teenagers. And it was like, oh my God, like what is this? I'd never seen it before. So in Making Pariah, for example, I was, I was working out my own identity and I was interested in exploring it in a way that was free of the typical tropes. You know, it's not just because New York City people think urban and then urban becomes a code word for black and even in terms of how we pitch the film, people said, oh yeah, this is gonna be a really gritty film. I'm like, well, what's gritty about it really other than they're black people, you know? And so um, I just like to like <laughs> interrogate the language used about the work and so as a filmmaker, my intention was just to kind of create specific characters and specific stories and you know, these characters don't stand for all black people and this family is not like anybody else's family on this stage and th th this person's reaction is not like anyone else's reaction and I think you know being able to have a space to do that you know. So you were more interested in the normative qualities of the kind of categories that you create within your films so a black family just the kind of you're interested in the normative dimension of their life not just because they are a black family. 
Absolutely, and just, just, it's like I mentioned like in the dynamics, like it was about secrets, like this is a family who keeps secrets. And then in Bessie, like this is not just a story about an entertainer, like this is a story about a woman who is lonely, you know, who goes home at night to an empty home. So I think about, I try to think thematically about characters and like maison scene and not just about, you know, you know, and through Bessie, you're going to see why she was like, you know, an icon in terms of like, of like uh, sexual expression and how she freed women, but I'm not going to like, you know, ram it down your throat, you're going to come to understand that. But first, you're going to understand her as this woman who's struggling with loneliness, who's struggling with her inner world, not matching her, her, her outer world, and that's the way in. I'm going to piggyback on my sister here because uh, for me, it's the story I'm trying to tell. So I'm not worried about imagery because I know that's going to come from the story. So the story for me is always first and foremost. You know, that's the story's determine how it's gonna look, how it's gonna feel, uh, the costumes, the music, the cinematography, the editing, all that comes. The first step is what is the story we're trying to tell? And then being this uh, a film is not just me alone, so it's myself with the cinematographer, the production designer, the costume designer, the editor, uh, the person's d doing the score, all of us, you hope that we all come together in concert to tell the same story. So for me, it's the story first and foremost. Hey, Oakwood, this, this makes me think that there might be a fundamental difference between the way an artist might frame the work that we do versus um, art historians or those who reflect on image practices. So like, let's say when I'm making a, 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 a film with the black monks, I'm not preoccupied with, I wouldn't use terms like image making when I'm shooting. I'm interested in ecstasy, let's say. I'm interested in um, a, a unison. And so I'm, I'm talking about the work from the perspective of um, organizing a shot so that the thing delivers the feel that I want, right? But once that shot is done, then a, another kind of critical response can happen to it. So that like, in a way, image framing and uh, structuring a reflection on image is different than the production of images, right? And, and so what I love is that I feel like Dee and Spike are talking about storytelling as a kind of productive device, and that you need images to tell the story, but there's not a preoccupation in the moment with like, now, I may want, you know, I don't have any hair, so my guys who have hair, I might want their hair to do a certain thing because I'm actually concerned with ecstasy, and I understand that their hair doing that thing you know, or us wearing loose clothes makes it more likely, you know, I'm wearing my Prada pants today, they stretch. You know what I'm saying? Us having these stretchy clothes means that I have a lot more um, emotional, psychic freedom to do my thing. But then you'll be able to catch a frame of me doing something that I couldn't do unless I had the preconditions that sometimes I'm more preoccupied with the preconditions of image making than I am with the image itself. The images themselves are a byproduct of st storyboards, of, of kind of creating a bed of opportunity that others can participate in. And then it's like, oh, let's see what, those, what, what happens with those images. It's in a spike, when you look back to a film like She's Gotta Have It, and do the right thing. Um, films that seem to me that they could be made today. Um, do you think you were prophetic or were you just lucky? My friends call me Negro Damas. <laughs> uh, I'm a big baseball fan, 
And Branch Rickey, who signed Jackie Roberts of Brooklyn Dodgers, had a famous quote, luck is a residue of design. So you're not going to be blessed by luck if you're not busting your ass and working. So, and this is something. D is one of my few students that listen to that. <laughs> because, again, I'm speaking as a, a professor of film and just being a teacher. One of the worst things that are, that are taught to young people is this terrible narrative of, over, of an overnight success. There is no such thing as an overnight success. People might, you know, they might say that, but they won't tell you about how they were selling blood to eat or whatever they were doing. You know, people, the ones that made it, they hustled. And you have to have, a, I'm speaking to the students here too, you have to have a belief in who you are, you have to have master your craft, and you have to work hard. If you just sit around and think the hand of God is going to come out of the sky and anoint you the next one. But I'm, I'm talking about both sociologically. I know, but I'm getting to it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Crack and K2 are a terrible thing. That ain't going to happen. So what she's going to have it was my second attempt to do a feature film. I finished NYU Graduate Film School with a film called Joe's Best Side Barber Shop and won the Student Academy Award. I thought right away the students, the students would be calling me. No one called. Then I tried to do a film called uh, The Messenger. It was a complete disaster. I got involved with some shady producers and the, and the money never came together. So She's a Habit was really uh, a desperate attempt to be a filmmaker. And we shot in 12 days, two six day weeks, July 1st to July 14th, 1985. The budget was $175,000. We put that together, nickel by nickel. And so, every, I, I didn't really know what I was doing, she's gonna have it. Also, next film, School Days, it wasn't until the third film, Do the Right Thing, where I became comfortable as a director. And one of the, the things about coming out of film school has been my view is that in film school, students are much more comfortable dealing with the equipment than dealing with actors. I didn't really know how to talk to actors my first two films, so do the right thing. It was, there's some things in that film that I'm not happy about. The murder of Ray Rahim by NYPD was based upon the murder of a graffiti artist, Michael Stewart. But then to see later on Eric Gardner murdered the same way Ray Rahim was, which is a film, but based upon real life. I mean, that's not, that's not something I wanted to be correct about. So, and then we had, we, we kind of were ahead of the, the, the riots and, the, and I'm not gonna use riot, the uprise in LA. We were talking about global warming and do the right thing, gentrification, I mean, a whole lot of stuff that it was just happening around. I, I didn't have a crystal ball, but I was just, my antenna, I think as an artist, you have to have your, you don't have to, but you should, depending on the type of film you make, have your antenna up so you could receive what's happening in the world. In that time in New York City, there was a great racial unrest. And historically in New York City between Italian Americans and African Americans, I grew up in that. I mean. My family was the first black family to move into Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, which was a predominantly Italian-American neighborhood because the neighborhood was right by the docks and the majority of the dock workers were Italian-American. So all that stuff just impacted on me, you know, growing up. And I just had to be open to it.
he should tell that to Salvini. <laughs> and D, your, your, first, your first film, can you talk a little bit about your first film is that as a short and then as a feature film. Well, yeah, I, ironically, like, I had, you know, I was going through my own coming out experience and I thought, this is awful, you know, and this producer at the time was like, you should write about this. I was like, you're crazy. I don't want to write about this. I don't want to talk about it. So Pariah actually wrote as a feature while I was interning on Spike set for Inside Man. So I'd be on lunch breaks, like, writing, like, in this notebook. And so I always... Oh, well, you were yeah. writing on your lunch break? Yeah. <laughs> You weren't looking. We'll be locking up. <laughs> so um, for, for me, you know, it always, always intended it like as a feature. And at that point, I didn't know how it works. It was like 140 pages. It was awful. I needed to, I needed to graduate from film school. So I, we shot like the first act as a short film. And everyone was telling us like, no one's going to watch a 30 minute short. You can't make a 30 minute short. A short is 10 minutes. That's it. But, um, you know, we did it anyway. We, ha we had a series of grants, credit cards, and at the time, I owned my apartment in um, Clinton Hill, Brooklyn, which is a way to talk about, like, real estate and space, because it was only by leveraging that real estate that I owned that I was able to create. And so um, we shot the short film, took it around the festival circuits, and first, like, you know, we got many rejections, and it was, like, the queer circuit that first picked it up. And then Sundance picked it up the second time around. They had already rejected it once, but they picked it up like the second time. And then from there, um, we you know, workshopped it and trimmed it down into a feature film, which we shot. And we never had the money at once. We got like a $50,000 grant. And so we said, okay, let's just go because we're never going to get more than 50. And then bit by bit, like as we're shooting, money would come in. And then we got enough money to get it out the lab. Then after we got it out the lab, then we paid the editor for a couple of weeks. Then we had to stop. Then we got more money to pay the editor for some more weeks. Yeah. So it was just like, you know, really put together. Like we never had all the money at once. It was like a $500,000 film. But it was just, you know, about, you know, wanting to tell your story and like wanting to just believing it and like it was a gamble and in fact in making the feature I ended up selling the Brooklyn apartment because that was the way to like live for three years after film school with student loan debt and be able to then create so like I'm really interested in the Astors leveraging over those worlds like leveraging like real estate and kind of how you're exploring physical space and the ability to create and the artist herself you know like that's to me the thing to crack because that's what no one tells you like you know, and you, you, you have to survive, you have to exist, just exist in order to be able to, to create, yeah. And Okwe, graduate school doesn't teach you how to do that. An MFA doesn't tell you, buy a flat in Brooklyn when you graduate. Before you graduate. You know, before you, gra scra scrap, before you graduate, scrap all your money together, figure it out, invest in yourself, right? And that, that was, part and parcel, absolutely necessary to a future act of creation. That, that your participation in another market uh, uh, predetermined your ability to participate in the thing you love. Who talks about that? But if I, could, I, if I may just say this, as uh, the artistic director of New York University Graduate Film School, <laughs> sir, yes. when students graduate NYU, they over a quarter of a million dollars in student loans just to make their, just to go to school, and that's not even including to pay for their films. So I don't know how, and especially today, no student I know of to buy a space in Gentrify Brooklyn and then go to film school and then pay for your films too. It's but I bought that space before film school. That was the thing. I was working in corporate yeah, America. But I'm, yeah. but I'm, but yeah. I'm talking about you were born at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have students that when they finish their third year in NYU owe more than a quarter million dollars in student loans. And that is hanging over their head every single moment and they have to pay rent, they got to eat, and then they got to somehow come up money for their films. I mean, it, it's, it's no joke, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's serious business. Well, you know, Tiesa, I want to come back to uh, the Johnson Archive yes. and, you know, what you've done 
you know, with this archive to not on, only bring it to life, but also to bring a new kind of consciousness, you know, to understanding, you know, the various manifestations within the Johnson enterprise, both in relation to questions of citizenship in, and nation building. And how do you see that relationship today, you know, as you begin to sort of walk through these images, through this archive? What do you, what do you see as a state of the archive mm -hmm. um, in, in, you know, in the near future, this particular archive? Mm -hmm. Well, there were two really important books that I read when I was a little bit younger. One was a book called Archive Fever, okay? And in, and in Archive Fever, this um, art historian critic was put himself to the task of describing how artists had been engaged in varying forms of archival work that spanned family investment, personal history, bureaucracy, the state. And, and it gave me a framework. This is Oakley's book. This is Oakley's book. Okay. And it gave me a framework for understanding. I would like to have a signed copy, please. It gave me a framework for understanding the, the, the capacity that information had to become aesthetic. That it, that it was one of the first moments where I realized that art wasn't just about uh, object making, but it could also be about the potentiality of framing, structuring information, right? And that, that learning that almost anything could be redirected through another lens and utterly transformed into the aesthetic, into the critical, into the political, into the spiritual, or it could just be dormant stuff. So that was one book. The other book was um, Warburg. And and it's an atlas, yeah. it's a, it's a, it was his uh, atlas book. And it was like this moment where I realized that one subject, like uh, glass bottles, if, if, I was interested in a, if I was interested in a glass bottle, and I wanted to go deep on the subject of glass bottles, that that thing, that one subject alone, could be unending. And the, the environmental, political, physical, um, poetic, the, the implications of bottleness, bottleness <laughs> could go on and on. And, and, and when, I, when I was armed with both a survey of archival practices and permission to go deep into a thing, what I realized was that I could never, I could choose to never leave home and have more art to make than three lives and that I just wanted to go deeper and deeper into myself, or deeper and deeper into a kind of blackness. But when you look at something like the Johnson Publishing Company, it's easy to read it simply as a collection of black images. But if you were to open up the parameters of archival work, you could then imagine that the thing that I'm looking at is a history of political ideology, of uh, economic self-determinism. It's a history of fashion. Uh, it's, a, it's a history of um, aesthetics through nation building. Black hair. Black hair. Leave that out. And so. History of photography. A history of photography. And so depending on the valence, the pivot, it is reasonable that the Johnson Publishing Archive makes as much sense on the sixth floor of the Observatorio as it does in the original Johnson Publishing Office. And I think that that's what's so amazing and ubiquitous about 
images, but also what's so amazing and sexy about blackness is that when you look at a black woman from 1950 in uh, an, amazing, an amazingly designed dress that may have been made in Italy, because a black woman is wearing it, you think she's wearing a black dress. In fact, she's being an Italian model. It's a black woman being an Italian model for an Italian brand. But it just depends on how closely we're willing to read and how, how, how fine-tuned we're willing to peel the onion back. And I think that th that's the gift of an archive, is that it could give you a surface read, or it could give you a magical, fantastic ride, depending on your capacity to read. I want everyone to please go see this, what he's talking about, please. Please, you, everybody living here in Milan, this has never been seen before. It, they haven't even seen this in Chicago yet. You're the first, can I just say something? And one other thing I'd like to say, what, when, I, when, when Ty and I, we went to see it, what it made me think about is that I got to start being a curator with pictures of my family yeah. that is scattered all over cousins, uncles. We need to get me take the lead and just get my family's yes. archives. Yes. That's, that's, that's the inspiration you gave me by seeing your show. That, well, this, this is actually a really important point to me because if, if one part of the practice, Oakley, is about demonstration, like, let's say that I'm not, let's say I was not emotionally invested in archives, but no one collects black things. So I want to demonstrate that black things are important. So I, I, I lean on aesthetics to demonstrate the power of this archive. And it makes Spike Lee say, I should do a better job at looking at my own family. Bring it, come on now, come, come. on. Well, I have, so, I have so many questions to pose to the three of you, but I, th I think we are really running out of time. So perhaps this might be a good opportunity to open the floor to the audience. Um, questions, comments, uh, you know, just raise your hand. I believe there are microphones. Are there microphones? Hey, Okui. Yeah. While we're doing that, yeah. I would really like, um, D, D and I were talking backstage about these films that are being shown. Yeah. And I feel like for my first 15 minutes with you, I was like, I want to know this sister forever. And so, D, I was just hoping, Dee, if you could just share with this group what you were sharing with me just about what those films made you, made you consider. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got them. Yeah, no, so I was just like in, in looking at the films like I'd seen before and like this, looking at them together, the thing that occurred to me was the use of vernacular. And so I went back and watched Body and Soul by Oscar Michaud. And it's like a silent film, so, you know, it's on screen. I had a reaction. I was like, oh, like, why am I reacting? you know, when I read Zernal Hurston, no problem. And so, you know, it was just like kind of the idea we talked about with like intention and who the maker is. And then one of the things that I think is interesting in all these films is the use of vernacular, like like do the right thing with um, 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 Daughters of the Dust. It's like a very specific place and very specific characters. And even like the Pizant family, like none of them even, they don't even sound the same within the same family. And so I was kind of struck by that, those choices and like how specific it is and how in these different films, there's many different vernaculars and how that seems to be like a thematic kind of, or just a, a, a um, craft link, you know, in all of them, yeah. Excellent. Questions? We were told that um, if you would prefer to ask your question in Italian, that's cool, and it would be translated. Um, also, there's films showing all night and into 7 a.m. in the morning. So if y'all want to kick it with us all night and watch some films, they're right next door in the cinema space. There's a question down here. Where? OK. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Ms. Prada. Oh, man. <laughs> Hello. My question's for Spike. 
Your latest film, The Black Lens Member, is not set in a current time, obviously, and with the whole strong ending, how do you think the time that is on the film is similar or different to the situation right now with the whole racial question? Even though Black Klansmen takes place during the 70s, which is a period film, it's still contemporary. This film is about today. Uh, the ending is about today. A little over a year what happened in Charlottesville. And the midterm elections are coming up in November. And there's one here. Okay, one over here on the corner. Is, is there another microphone? Is this only just one? Yeah, can can we? Okay, we are artists based out of New Delhi, and we're here for an exhibition. Serendipitous that we kind of see everybody here. I have two questions. One is the curating under constraints. Uh, the second is for an artist creating under constraints. What an artist do? or what is the creator supposed to do in this volatile kind of uh, uh, precarious environment of today? So, so your question is about creating under constraints and what one is to do in this you know, particular environment? Exactly. I mean, I would say, for me, the big key has been surrounding myself with like a village of artists, and it's like finding other artists who want to play with you, you know, and you kind of grow up together and create for each other for free, you know? For example, like the top DP or the top production designer, you know, wasn't someone I had access to or who wanted to work with my career. But to me, like I then I grew up with the top DP, like Bradford Young, shot Pariah, you know. And so then, like you kind of find people around you who are interested in your work and your storytelling and whatever the medium or whatever the craft, who you can barter with and create trade with, and then you guys create together. Then you. Or work on their project, and then it has this cumulative effect where you're each learning your craft, you're each getting to, to practice your work, and then you're able to create with very little capital. Yeah, yeah this, this also feels, it feels timely to kind of think about Germano's work with Arte Pavra, because there's also this way in which the true conditions of making, you know, in this moment of high production costs in the art world, uh, you think that everything has to be made out of, uh, uh, you know, you know, casted aluminum that's been extruded and has an ultra ultra shine. But in fact, what I found is like kind of making work with the things that are around you, and maybe the things, you know, I use recycled materials because those were the only things that I were they were free and they were around me, and I was just trying to make the best art I could with the things of that day and of that context. And I think. I think I learned that from the Pavra school, you know, that there was a kind of everydayness, a kind of quotidian possibility. And it was like, that's actually what made it feel better to me than, than anything where like I had to reach far away to try to make it felt like if it was far away from me, it wasn't mine or something. So. That, that, that reminds me of Jimmy Lee Sutter, the, Am the Alabama painter who paints with mud and creates like these beautiful pieces. And also there's an artist I love, a contemporary artist named Frank Robinson. He's a Memphis artist. And he like does a lot of work with like diabetes test strips, you know, and does like a lot of found object work. So like a lot of the work I gravitate to is by so-called outside artists who are creating with, you know, things at hand. So. Spike, you have anything to say about that? You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> Work what you got. OK. Yeah. Question over here. Diaz, yeah, so this is for you. I noticed in Oakley's introduction, he mentioned very briefly that you, you're involved in nation building and community building and outreach. How did you develop the financial acumen to invest in some of these civic buildings and structures and work with the city to acquire these assets at little to no cost, but then reinvest and, you know, ac ac accumulate capital to be able to put into these buildings and then repurpose them 
for the community? How did you, as an artist, and because they tell us artists and uh, business, art and business don't mix, and so maybe that's obviously false. Right. When I, I, I used to apologize for n having not gone to art school, but I didn't go to art school. Um, my degrees were in urban planning and, and kind of religion. I took art classes and got a minor, but really I learned how to build from my, my mom and daddy, you know. I think it was planning that gave me a sense of how the world worked. And what I've learned about good business people is that like a good business person doesn't necessarily know finance. They'll have a financial strategist or a good accountant or a lawyer who can help them with that part. A good business person or a good artist should have vision. And if, if one focuses on their vision and say, I think we have the capacity to change the way black space is imagined. If you could make a statement like that, then there are all these little things that need to happen, like I gotta learn how to buy a building. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to buy a building. When I bought my first building, I celebrated for like three weeks. I kept having like, I had like 10 housewarming parties. <laughs> you know, by the fourth building, I was in another state. Somebody else went to the closing. I didn't even know. Sometimes people would text me and say, hey, we closed on 7030 today. And that over time, there was a kind of, um, I focused on the, the the vision, right? And then I would have to ask people to help me. And I needed, I, I still need all kinds of help. I'm in the middle of it. I ain't figured nothing out. But now that we have 40 buildings, $60 million worth of investment, I'm looking at other models and saying, how do we make this cohesive? What do I do with this stuff now that I've demonstrated it and I want to make art again. This, these buildings now have to be managed. The grass got to be cut. The, 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 the dog stuff has to be picked. You know, one day I came to, this, to this, this campus. It had just rained in a, one of those square uh, wooden pieces had popped up. And there was a dude. Like, what is this dude doing? And it's like, oh, that's the dude who when it rains and the squares pop up, he's the dude that hits the square back down so that all the squares are level. That's somebody's job. <laughs> Nobody told me about the amount of management it would take to manage 45 buildings. And so it's like every time I'm learning all these things, but I keep, I gotta kind of keep my eyes on the prize. It's like, we want black people in Chattanooga and, and we want young people in Milan to say, I'm willing to get with my people and buy a piece of property so that we never have to be worried about being pushed out of a place. We all know the story of Soho at what point are we as artists gonna be post Soho? When we're, when we're no longer saying, oh, we were here and then the developers came and oh, the Mr. Developer, he didn't push us out again. And oh, we can't even afford the sushi that's down the street. At what point are we gonna be past that conversation? We, we read it all the time on, that we are the reasons why neighborhoods grow and change. If we don't have deep investment, mm. emotional, spiritual, physical, material, financial investment mm. in these places, shame on us. Mm. Come on now. <laughs> Come on, brother. Tell it. Make it plain. Tell it. <laughs> well, well, on, on. On, 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 on that note, I would like to use the opportunity. Oh, I would like to use the opportunity to thank everyone here, and to thank uh, the Prada Foundation 
Astrid and her team, and of course, Mrs. Prada for having us here and making it possible uh, to engage in this conversation. Let me just simply end by saying that in, in terms of talking about property, um, it's very clear that space is where ideas and discourses can take place fearlessly are diminishing. And this is what makes the Prada Foundation very special, that it's an experimental place that enables Yeah, so thank, thank you so much. So I say thank you in the name of the Prada Foundation, in the name of Mrs. Prada, in the name of our people here in Milan. Thank you for talking to us. Everybody can go to the cinema tonight to see a movie by Spike Lee, Do the Right Thing, and more movies, Melvin Van Peebles and Raoul Peck and uh, Otto Preminger until 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. And the entire selection of films which they have to made for us are again on view here in October and November. And we're going to show The Black Clansman of Spike Lee in October and November. So check our program and thank you all very, very much.